Sneakers and Cleats, the podcast. Welcome back to the Sneakers and Cleats podcast. It's Monday, June 24th. This is episode 112. Remember to download, rate, review, subscribe, use five-star rating. That's Chuck McAtinick. Matt Roy. Chuck, you are back and better than ever after going to the College World Series. It's like your Never Never Land. That was really, really a lot of fun, and shame on me for taking 59 years of my life to finally get there, Matthew. That was, it was fun not having to work and just enjoying baseball and watching my Aggie son get to watch his team do very, very well there yeah, to this point. Hopefully get to see them do well again tonight. Which that would le- be nice. Which leads me into... Charles Dickens once said, it's the best of times and the worst of times. Today is the best of times because you have a Game 7 in the uh, Stanley Cup Finals. You have the Game 3 of the College World Series. And then after that, it sucks. The whole sporting landscape sucks after this because there's no ba- there's no basketball. There's no, um, there's no hockey. There's no football. It's just baseball. And I, I love baseball. I don't want to talk crap on MLB baseball. But there's nothing else. Well, we've got the All-Star Game coming to Arlington, so that's pretty cool, the Major League Baseball All-Star Game. So, I mean, that's right around the corner. Look, before you know it, football training camp will be here, but I realize in dog years, yes, it seems like it's an eternity away. <laughs> June or July is like the worst sporting month of the year. It's, I mean, you have one weekend where it's the, the Open Championship, you have a little bit of baseball, and it's just like there's nothing else. It's, I'm so, it's the worst. October? is the complete opposite. October, there's everything. So um, I'm with you. That's a hard month to hate. Yeah. October's great. July sucks. And that's just how it is. Um, but anyway, we're going to make the most of it anyway. So we got a lot going on today, obviously, the best of times. We ha- we're going to talk a lot about the NBA draft. Don uh, is not here, obviously. He is – I think he's already landed in Brooklyn. He left at like 6, 10 a.m. this yes, morning. Yes, they're so. there because Jack sent me a picture – or. 100% greatest photographer ever. <laughs> He's already at a pizza place with two slices of pepperoni pizza Atta sitting boy. in front nice. of him. Atta boy, Jack. Just, just please, Jack, protect the roof of your mouth. Pizza <laughs> in New York. If you're not careful, you'll come home with some scars. No scalding. No scalding right. here. Um, so they're already there. He's not here, obviously. But last night, uh, Don get, did get to sit down with a couple of guys from the Express News, uh, Jeff McDonald. And uh, Mike Finger, who know pretty much all there is to know about what the Spurs may do and may not do coming up. So we'll get to hear a little bit of that. Also, there's already disruption in Big D, um, according to... A... <laughs> Love it! <laughs> according to... Um, you say there's nothing to do during the summer. A local reporter, uh, Mike McCarthy, is already apparently sick and tired of Jerry Jones. And so we'll talk a little bit about that as well. But first, as we usually do, we will discuss... Number 12, the number game comes up first. Number 12, to me, there's only one number 12. When you think of number 12, Tom Brady is number 12. Okay. There's always going to be – he's always going to be number 12 uh, from now and henceforth. For me, growing up, it was Roger Staubach. So that was the number 12. Yeah, that's fair. And it doesn't matter – to me, it didn't matter. You know, I was living in Virginia at the time, but still, my brother had like a Roger Staubach jersey living in, you know, wonderful Washington country. So – I'll go with him, and then, of course, I'm going to go right to 12 in Green Bay. Yeah, but don't you think that, like, Tom Brady owns number 12 now? He has a brand, TB12. Like, he, he kind of has has taken over the 12. But when I think of Tom Brady, I just think of, you know, the face and the hair and obviously everything <laughs> that he did. But I don't necessarily think of the number associated with him, except for the number of Super Bowls that he won. That's fair. I mean, seven is, is, yes. <laughs> is the, it's a pretty good number, too. Yes. Um, what I didn't realize is how good the number 12 is when it comes to NFL quarterbacks. I was looking it up earlier, and I knew Staubach, obviously. I knew Aaron Rodgers. I knew uh, Tom Brady. And then it just, like, looking through the list of Terry Bradshaw and – uh, Jim Kelly and Joe Namath and Andrew Luck and Randall Cunningham and it's just yeah like that's the, a quite it a keeps list going on and on and on. It's just like okay, apparently if you're a good quarterback, you are the number twelve. <laughs> Roger that. Uh, also, twelves are um, John Stockton, good good basketball number twelve. Uh, Dwight Howard was twelve when he first came into the league. That was who he was or what he was when he was with the Magic when he was actually good. Um, and then when he was at the Lakers the first time, he was number 12 as well. So a couple of other 12s, just in case anyone thinks of it. Can you think of any 12s in baseball? I'm trying to think. I'm racking my brain right now. Um, Wade Anybody? Boggs, Wade Boggs was 12, 12 okay. with the Yankees, Okay, not with the Red Sox. So I was going to put him on the list, 
but to me that didn't really count. Twelve. Vladdy Debach was number twelve. Vlade. <laughs> Gotta love it. <laughs> um, also happening in 2012, Giants beat the Patriots for the second time, 21-17. The Patriots were two point favorites in that Super Bowl, unlike the uh, 20, 2007 Super Bowl when they were like seven and a half, ten point favorites, something like that. Um, Peyton Manning also signed with the Broncos that year. So thanks, Peyton. Appreciate you. Baseball, the Giants swept the Tigers. That was the second of their three World Series, right? They won 10, 12, 14. So that was the second of their World Series, three and five years. I'll take your word for it, yes. Uh, Pablo Sandoval, yes, that's the, true. the Kung Fu Panda, was the uh, MVP of that series. And then the Heat won four games to one over the Thunder. LeBron James, the uh, finals MVP, that was his first uh, title with the Heat, they ended up winning the next year as well. But we'll get to that on. Uh, we'll Pablo Sandoval, what, what a what a great ball player! The Kung Fu Panda, the Kung Fu Panda. I mean, isn't that good? I've never seen anybody with feet that could move like him at his size. And I saw him out one time at a restaurant with his family. <laughs> he was making sure that he kept that weight on. But what a gr- what a great guy and what a great personality! How great that guy was for baseball. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, he he was fantastic. And he went to the uh, Red Sox and then sucked, so it was good. <laughs> Big guy's hand. He got paid, though, too. <laughs> he did get paid. Amen. Uh, let's get to oh, – also, by the way, since Game 7, the Kings beat the Devils that year in the Stanley Cup Finals. So I'll just get to that real quick. All right, Spurs draft rumors. So uh, two days away now from the uh, NBA draft. The latest rumors are everything under the sun. They're literally just throwing everything against the wall and seeing what sticks. So Don had two Spurs insiders on Sports Sunday last night, Jeff McDonald and Mike Finger of the San Antonio Express News, two very reputable and, and knowledgeable Spurs um, reporters. Both guys have been covering them for a long time. So I wanted to play some of that here. This first part you're going to hear is about the false narrative surrounding Wemby possibly demanding that the Spurs win now. Let me ask you guys this to start. There's this new narrative, I think mostly put out there by ESPN, that Victor Wimbernyaba or his people have somehow, somehow told the Spurs that they need to accelerate the timeline, that because he had such a great rookie year, the time is now, he wants to win now. Do you guys buy that, or do you think that Wimby's been on board with their plan and that they will continue to build this brick by brick? I don't believe that that narrative comes from anywhere within Wimby's camp or anywhere within the walls of the Spurs camp. I think um, Victor Wimbanyama's probably been the most patient man in San Antonio when it comes to um, the rebuild that's that's in progress. Obviously, they have to make strides next season, but what does that look like? Does that look like a 50-win team? Probably not, and I think Wimby's on, on board with that. Uh, like he said, the, the very last time we talked to him at the end of the season, he realizes this has got to be built brick by brick. So you don't think they swing for the fences with a big-time free agent? Well, when we're talking about these narratives, I think the frustrating part for the viewers out there, the readers, the listeners, is there's pieces of truth to all of it, I think. I think that if you asked Victor Wimbanyama, the people around Victor Wimbanyama, would you like to win sooner or later, he'd say yes, of course. He's never lost like he did last year. I think that if the Spurs came to him and said, we're going to make an aggressive move this offseason, we're going to trade for a star, we're going to swing for the fences, whatever that may be, I think he'd be on board. But I don't think we're at a point yet where Victor and his people are going to the Spurs making demands yet. I, I think they might be encouraging aggression, but there are shades of gray to that. But the Spurs would be foolish, right, if they didn't go to him and say, uh, here's our plan. Right. We're going to draft number four and number eight, or we're going to maybe trade number four for a Tyus Jones, not the right. huge uh, free agent. We're going to continue to build this brick by brick. Are you cool with that? I, I've said this many times, but the moment that last lottery ball fell into place last year in Chicago, that, that second, the most important person in the Spurs organization became Victor Wimpenyama. Like, he, he has to have veto power on everything. And again, there's shades of gray to this. He's not demanding that veto power. You'd, you'd just be crazy if you're Greg Popovich, if you're General Manager Brian Wright, if you're CEO R.C. Buford. You'd be crazy to make a huge move and not tell the most important player in the, in the franchise about it first. Do you think that's, that's accurate? Fair. Do you think that's true and fair? Like, yeah. You would be – do you think that – I don't know. I don't know if you're crazy if you don't ask Victor first, but you it, it certainly want to make him happy and and make sure that they that he is willing to um, 
go along with the moves that you're making, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, you you said this aptly, I thought, which is, you know, everybody's gamed this out eight million ways to Sunday. And, you know, we've been here long enough in the Popovich era to know that you probably don't know at the end of the day how this is going to shape out. If for no other reason, there are other teams involved, right? If, if it's this was just the Spurs living in this world. So, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, if this is going to be a slow build, and if it was me, this is how I would do it, given this day and age of, you know, how superstars move about the league and do all these other kinds of things in terms of, you know, player mobility. I would just, if this was me, I would go – Take my four, take my eight. I've said it before. The best part about rookies is rookie contracts, unless there's a way to move Keldon Johnson in all of this, because Keldon Johnson's making a lot of good money. I think Keldon Johnson's a great player, but the Spurs have essentially told Keldon Johnson that he they like him better coming off the bench. Keldon probably views himself as a starter in the NBA, so given the fact that Keldon's making a lot of money, if they can move – Keldon with one of these picks for maybe another player that that's the only way I see you know maybe some trade stuff happening with the Spurs you know I'm sure they could package up and you know maybe package those two picks to do whatever but you know again I think if you you know there's got to be at least eight good ball players in this draft right I mean wouldn't oh, you think 100% so everybody we just don't know who the eight are <laughs> right okay so that that's fair too so be that as it may I'm willing to concede that the Spurs probably know who 15 players are that would fit what they want to do. I would be very judicious with how they parcel this out. But, you know, I'm just as curious as anybody, and I think that's the great thing about, you know, we do this for every sport, right, going into a draft, is you can spitball and you can game plan and you can game out how some of these things are going to go. And at the end of the day, we'll see what happens. But at least it gets everybody (laughs) talking and everybody's interested. Yeah, when it comes to Victor, I mean – Nobody has been more invested into San Antonio than he has. I, the way that he's integrated himself into the culture, the way he's integrated himself and and um, endeared himself to fans and, and to everybody who does support the Spurs has been something that I think you can write how-to books about. He's done it the right way. I think what where the impetus for all of that, like the narrative of Victor wants to win now comes from, I think part of that has to do with Pop's age. Because you have this central figure in all of these moves and all of these and this whole dynasty in Greg Popovich, he's clearly not getting any younger. How much longer is he going to stick around? And is that going to affect Victor as well? So I think part of the accelerate the timeline narrative comes from one, Victor's great and he already is great. He's only going to get better. But two, Coach Pop is nearly 80 years old and he's probably only got a couple years left. Are they going to accelerate it for him as well? I think that plays into it. Sure. I'm sure there's a lot of varying factors, but I think Don said it best. I mean, you know, ESPN is in the business for creating narratives, right? And what does this do? We're talking about a bunch of teams, you know, especially at the bottom end, that there are probably a lot of people or there are a lot of fans in those fan bases that have lost interest. This creates interest for especially the lower level teams that you hope you're gonna your squad's gonna get, you know, one or two players out of this that might end up making or being the difference to turn your team around. So, you know, some of this is just to create stuff, create stories, to get people talking like we are. And, you know, you can't blame them because Again, there are people that are interested in this kind of stuff. So if somebody throws out there that, of course, Victor wants to win now. Who doesn't? I'm sure he well, yeah. doesn't want to freaking lose, <laughs> you know, or win 20 ball games a year. Nobody does. So, you know, it's probably fair that somebody said that. And at the end of the day, you know, the Spurs probably have a long-term plan. I'm sure they do. I know they do. Yeah, how they're gonna How they're going to parcel this out. And just to put a pin in that conversation, it's like, Victor wants to win. Of course he wants to win. Everyone wants to win. He's not going to demand a trade in the next two to three years if they're not winning the the, the uh, championship. If they win 40 games next year and then 50 games the year after that, that's good. That's, that's a fine rebuild because you have Victor hopefully for the next 15 years. So the whole, the whole they need to win now thing, like, yes, I want to win now. I think all of them want to win now. But the whole thing is just so overblown with – 
with Brian Winhorst and all of sure. the ESPN guys that are like, yeah, they want to win now, and he's going to demand that they win now. It's like, no, he's he's here. He's here for the long haul. They have him for at least five years, if not eight, because they're the only ones that can offer him that long-term extension on the rookie deal anyway. And it's not like he's Anthony Bennett of 2013 where he's already out of the league in one year. He's probably a top 15 player in the league already. So I just – people people go crazy on that sort of stuff. But let's get um, a little bit more – in depth with uh, Jeff and Mike, they were talking about what they think the Spurs will do with four and eight, which I found pretty interesting as well. I, I'm going to sound like Brian Wright here, and it's frustrating. And it's, <laughs> I, I get frustrated listening to talking to Spurs people all the time too. But it's true. I think that they are going to stay flexible, and I wouldn't be shocked if they traded up. I also wouldn't be shocked. I'm, I, in fact, I'm sort of warming up to the idea that they might try trade down a couple times in this draft where there's no clear consensus on who number one is, who the top three are, who the top eight are. If they like a guy and think, hey, we can trade down two spots and still get him at six instead of four or at 10 instead of eight, I would not be shocked to see them do that either. Let's say their two needs are shooting and a point guard. And I'm not sure it is a point guard the way that Victor and Devin handled basketball. But you know, the narrative out there is, is they definitely need a point guard, a true point guard. If that's the case, we've got about a minute. Tell me who you guys like if they need shooting, if they need a point guard, or tell me who you think they're going to take it for an eight. I'll go ahead and say I'm pro Stefan Castle at four. Um, I'm not saying they're taking him, but he can. he's versatile. He can defend. He's coming off a national championship at UConn, play the one or the two. The shooter could be Dalton Connect out of Tennessee at eight. Uh, then there's also uh, Jeff's a big on Jeff's a big Devin Carter fan. I'll I'll let you take over I, there. I, I like the idea of Devin Carter because I think you can probably get him at eight. I yeah. think Stefan Castle, you're going to have to make that move at four if he's even still on the board at four. I think Devin Carter, you get a a guy with a lot of he's was the star of the combine, had all the measurables, the the vertical leap, uh, the speed, um, and I think he's a guy you, you can get to fill that sort of point guard slot at eight and that would free you up at four to take the take a guy that you you really want regardless of, of fit i think the fit um i, I like both of those um yeah scenarios solid. stefan castle i really really like i don't know if he's going to be there at four uh devin carter i'm not sold on however i think that what this we're going to see the spurs do is best player available that they, they don't yes they have a lot of glaring needs they need shooting they need a point guard i think that those are pretty set in stone they could use <clears throat> excuse me a big man as well I think they're going to go best player available because the the boards for this draft are completely different from when you ask the Spurs as if you ask the Hawks if you ask the Wizards they're going to have a completely different top 10 with maybe the same names but in completely different orders so they could have very easily their number one player available to them at four they could very easily have their number three player available to them at eight. So why not choose those guys? Or if they're available at six, you trade up. If they're available at 10, you trade back. Like they have so many options here that it's going to be a best player available draft. For them. I, I'm, I'm with you. That should be the scenario always, especially in a league where positions and, you know, the traditional one through five on the floor has kind of been blurred over the last decade or probably longer than that. You know, where guys, you just want Guys that are big, athletic, and can shoot. And obviously, you know, if your best asset is Victor Wimbanyama with his size and length and his ability to, you know, you could play everything through him. So, you know, I know it's an inside-out league, but even more so, the Spurs have to be better at that next year. So who are the guys that best fit working around, you know, having a traditional five in Victor but yet somebody that, you know, you can play kind of like the old triangle offense that the Bulls did. Run everything through him, and then, you know, you vary everything around what's going on around Victor. So, yeah, you need some shooters, but I think best available, that's always the best way to go. We haven't heard from our uh, digital director, Bob Gambert, yet. Bob, what's going on? Hey, so um, Robert Smith has got a lot of great comments in uh, the chat right now with the live stream. But first of all, he reminded us, a uh, number 12, Bruce Bowen, Oh, uh, well done. Yes. Yeah. That See, so, that's another good bad. one. I forgot about that. Yep. Big shout out Double to Robert B. for yep. that. Uh, good, 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 good. And then he also says uh, um, the Spurs can't screw up this draft. Stay with the two picks. That That's his advice. I don't um, think I don't actually don't think they can screw it up. Like if you trade back and you get some, we don't we won't know who these guys, how good these guys are, and for a couple of years right. anyway. I don't think that they can really screw it up unless you pick an Anthony Bennett or something. 
Interesting question from Lem the King. He wants to hear more about the workouts. Have you guys heard anything at all about the workouts? Stefan Castle and Risha Shea, I'm going to pronounce that wrong up until draft day. Uh, Risha Shea both uh, worked out last week for the Spurs. One of them got a uh, saloon who Don had been telling us was the Spurs were really high on, uh, Tijane Saloon, got hurt during his workout with the Spurs. Whoa. So that was a little uh, – he, he ended up canceling out the rest of his – uh, the rest of his workouts after that. But they're really high on Risha Shea and Saloon, from what Don is saying. Um, the workouts have all been pr going pretty well. Apparently, Alex Saar is not working out very well for many teams. He's the uh, he's another guy. I think he's the Frenchman um, that's seven foot and can play and do a lot of things. He's probably going to go two to the Wizards. But he apparently, his workouts are not going very well. Hey, speaking of Frenchmen, uh, Jonathan De La Rosa says, uh, sign a Euro guard or a EuroLeague point guard that can give Wemby the ball. Alessandro, Alessandro Pajola <laughs> is uh, 24 and can shoot three. Right, so know. that's that's the default around here all these years, just right? When in doubt, <laughs> just find a European player that you know they're going to like because they always have, and it's worked out pretty well for them over time in that regard. So... You know, again, they're going to do things, and they're going to keep things well on the down low. We don't even know if some of these workouts are just there as smoke screens to try to throw people off the scent. You know, in, in terms of workouts, I mean, it's famous now that Tony War Tony Parker blew his workout yeah, so workout. badly that they had to talk Pop into drafting him anyway, and next thing you know, you have a Hall of Famer. So it's kind of hard. You know, you never know – you know, guy's nervous because he's working out in front of all these people or, yeah. you know, whatever the case may be. Also, a lot of times when those workouts happen, um, a lot of the biggest thing takeaways from that are the private meetings, are like getting to actually know the kid and see how he eats, see how he interacts around the facility, getting to know them on a personal level and not really on the basketball court because you can see the film. You know what they are on the basketball court. You don't really know how they are as a person and as a personality, how they're going to mesh with your organization. So that's a lot of stuff we don't hear, and that's a lot of the stuff that we – don't particularly know about these players. Another comment from um, Robert Smith. He says, Kel L. Ware. I, mean, I don't know if I'm saying that right, Dan. Yeah. You know, that he he's, says he's really intriguing. Do you, do you guys? He's a, uh, sol he's a solid player. I don't think he's going to go in the top 10, though. So I, I don't think he's going to be an option for the Spurs unless they trade out. Um, th so that'll be interesting. One of, the, one of the things I'm really interested in about this draft is I think there's a very real possibility that Donovan Klingon, the center for UConn, goes really high. And I think he I think the Spurs might be intrigued by getting him at four and then drafting Devin Carter at eight because putting Klingon, a hugely defensive guy who has the quickness and ability to get out to the three, maybe become a stretch five, has the has the lateral quickness to get out and maybe, you know, contest on a three, but also get back to his post, has that recoverability. I think they'll be really intrigued by pairing him with Victor and having the best defensive front court that the NBA has ever seen. Um, and then you still get Devin Carter or, or Rob Dillingham or Reed Shepard, whoever you want, at number eight, whoever's available. Um, I think that would be a really interesting. The Twin pick. Towers Part 3. Wouldn't that be awesome, yeah, though? I'd be, like, I'd be okay with that. It's, it's like, why don't you just take Rudy Gobert with a decent mid-range and outside shot Put him on uh, the Spurs and pair, couple him up with Wemby. Like that's that's what you'd be doing. Rudy Gobert is the comp for Donovan Klingon. So I just hope Kevin McCullough gets drafted real high too. The young man from Wagner. I mean, played at Kansas yep. the last couple years. I mean, here's a guy that plays the game the right way. He's long. He's athletic. He's a defensive minded guy. First, he's I think can be a good scorer in this league if you know given maybe a little bit of time. I know. You know, he wasn't able to participate in the tournament last year because of a bone bruise that also kept him out of the combine. But I think somebody's going to get a steal with Kevin McCullough Jr. too. I'm going to be really interested to see where Zach Eady goes as well. But I don't, I don't know if they're going to go anywhere in the top ten. Anything else before we move on from the draft? One last comment from Rapid Rick. He said he'd take Dillingham at four. That's Dillingham might fall out of the top 15. He might fall out of the lottery. Um, he's He is not, according to ESPN and other – uh, CBS and all those guys. Rob Dillingham, the Kentucky guard, has not performed well in workouts, and they're not really convinced that he can develop an outside shot. He might be able to because, like we said, anything's possible in this draft. Especially when you're talking about the youth of these players. Yeah, anything's possible in this draft, especially. You don't know where everyone has them ranked. Rob Dillingham could go in the 
top three. He could go outside the top 20. Like, you really don't know. However, according to – if if the people who know – are in the know know what they're talking about, he's probably going to fall out of the top five at least and maybe out of the top 10. Uh, even though Jonathan Gavoni over at ESPN and their mock today have them take – have the Spurs taking him at eight – I am nowhere near convinced that they like him that much to take him at eight. Um, let's move on to some Cowboys stuff before we get out of here. So um, the Cowboys don't play a game for another two and a half months, and already there's turmoil in Big D. Um, Tyler Dunn of Go Long says that he spoke to Cowboys sources, and quietly, Mike McCarthy is seething. He says McCarthy believes that Jones has put him in a no-win situation, that Mac is fed up with Jerry and uh, fed up with being undermined. What do you what do you make of of that situation? I mean, I I think it's certainly possible, and I don't want to you know poo poo anything that is being reported because I don't know you know if that's true or not. This reporter is pretty much the lone ranger on this, but yep. let's just say for you know we have no reason to think that this isn't true or that he didn't get it from somebody that knows something that we don't. But I do know this: the way I understand it is Mike McCarthy does have an agent now, and he didn't have one, so. Start with that, and I think Mike McCarthy is definitely, and it would behoove him to be thinking long-term here, even if the Cowboys, based on McCarthy's current contract situation, maybe not be thinking more than one year. But there's a lot of guys that are in the same canoe this year with the Cowboys, right? The entire quarterback room, Mike McCarthy, and what's, you know, I've said this before too. Mike Zimmer as well. Yes. I mean, What's wrong with honoring your contract? Why is it a given that Mike McCarthy is supposed to get years tagged on to his contract when they have a hard time winning playoff games? The only thing, I mean, when it comes to honoring your contract, there's a bunch of minutiae there because it's only is it's only good to the owners to honor the contract when they want to honor the contract. If they don't want to honor it, they can fire you on the spot and they'll just pay you out, and that's fine. Right, but. So that's why, like, honoring the contract never sits well for me because, like, players sign a five-year deal and they're gone in two years and you never see it. Like, but at least they're getting, you know, when they sign that contract, that's what they sign up for. So it's not like this is, you know, that there's not language in there that they know what they're getting into when they sign that contract. I think that's a good point, though, as far as McCarthy kind of setting himself up for the future because – I think Mike McCarthy is very well set up or is is – has been set up, excuse me, by Jerry and by the organization to be the fall guy if this all fails this year. If it fails because Dak doesn't have a good year, it comes back on McCarthy. If they succeed, it doesn't go to McCarthy. It goes to Dak. It goes to the front office if these front office moves end up playing out. If the front office moves don't end up playing out, then it falls right on Mike. And so I think that what you said about him having an agent makes sense because now you have people putting it out there like, oh, he didn't want this roster. Oh, he didn't approve of these moves they didn't do enough to help him and so next year if he does end up getting fired he can go to another job interview and be like this is actually what i wanted to do there's you know this works i think for both guys right it's like it's for all the criticism that the organization has taken for not giving dak an extension beyond this year to this point and then also the same thing with mccarthy you've got you know mccarthy has done very, very well coaching this football team, right? 13 wins every year for the last three, right? 12. Is that what it is? 12? Okay. So would you want him coaching your team? If I was Jacksonville or somebody else with one of these young, unproven coaches, I mean, he's proven organizationally that he knows how to run a ship. Now, it hasn't paid dividends yet in the postseason, but the story is not written. There's one more year left on this. And, you know, I can understand why McCarthy's mad, in a lot of ways in terms of, you know, playing out his contract and feeling like he's probably done enough or has earned the right to work beyond in Dallas beyond this season. The other side of it is when Jerry hired McCarthy, it was for one reason, to, to win a Super Bowl. Bowl. And to this point, they haven't proven that they can get close. And correct me if I'm wrong, but this – undermining for lack of a better term or or having jerry's hand in the cookie jar at all times that's not going away and it never has gone away like that's how it was with jason garrett that's how it was with wade phillips that's how it was with bill parcells that's how it was with jimmy johnson's the reason he left like jerry is gonna have his hand on the pulse of the team and if you can't accept that you shouldn't have accepted the job correct 
And he was unemployed, and he was out of the league for a year, McCarthy was, before he got hired by the Cowboys. So, again, I see this from both sides. I don't blame Coach McCarthy for – if he is irritated – for, you know, he's he probably has earned the right to work in Dallas beyond this year. But let's also not forget where we were in January when they were losing a playoff game where there was some question as to whether or not, whether or not he was going to be able to work his final year of his contract. Uh, yeah, and I don't want to um, uh, backtrack on something I said in, in January. I thought Mike McCarthy should have been fired. I thought they should have fired him after the game. Like as soon as he got back in the locker room, like see you later. That was a horrible performance, and he obviously did not – do what it took to win that game. Neither did the players, but it's easier to fire a coach than it is to fire the players. Yes, I mean, organizationally, nobody did their job on that day. That was across the board. I mean, you can't let the youngest team in the league where even their fan base didn't think they were going to win come into your house yeah. and then run you off your own field. Speaking of which, and this is a complete digression, did you see the video, and I should have queued it up, and I am mad that I didn't. Um, did you see the video of Micah Parsons was at – kindergarten or he was yes. with some kids <laughs> so did. he was with some kids and one of the kids says to Micah Parsons I saw you play and he's like oh which game he's like against the Packers <laughs> and Micah Parsons is like I need you to delete that from your memory right now don't ever talk about that game again I like that tweet because it was, it was such so a funny. pure response it right so I mean it was it was nice very well handled by Micah Parsons oh it was he's like yeah just forget about that don't yes. don't remember but <laughs> just thinking about that game that's what I think of now but as far as getting back to the to the question at hand I think it would be hard for Mike McCarthy to not feel fed up, to not feel undermined, because that's just what Jerry does. Jerry is Jerry. He's always going to have a say. He's always going to have something to say. He's always going to make a headline. I think that he also has a, a point with this roster has not been improved the way that it should have been improved. If anything, you can make a very strong argument that this roster is worse than it was than last year. Is that The reasons for that are money and of course, in that you can't pay everybody with the the money that you have to pay for uh, Dak, Micah, and CD, and I get that. But you can make a very strong argument that this roster is considerably worse in that he has been set up to fail and, and might be the scapegoat if this season goes horribly. Yes, I, I think your point is well taken. I mean, if you go into this season and you say, well, what has to happen for the Cowboys to win 12 ball games again and then potentially make a deep playoff run, there's a lot of boxes that have – that are empty right now because you don't know if the new guys on the offensive line are going to gel, if the offensive line is going to mesh at all. Are the guys that they're turning over on the defensive line, some of the younger guys that they've had in the system, now they're turning over or giving them the keys to the car, are they going to work out? How's this? How's the DB room going to work together? You know, you brought in some new pieces at linebacker. You've got youth at that position. How's that all going to work? You know, what's going to happen on 88's contract? I mean, you can go right down the list. All these things that you go into the season, it's like there weren't this many question marks last year. So to your point, I'm 100% with you. But what's wrong with McCarthy now being just a little more incentivized because now he's playing for – or he's coaching for I mean, his next contract. Nothing's wrong with it. But do, if let's say they go out there and they win the Super Bowl this year. Why would Mike McCarthy ever want to re-sign a contract here? Why Why would he ever want to go through this again? Like, it, it just doesn't make any sense. Even if they, if they go through and they make it to the NFC Championship game for the first time in 28 years now – there was no reason there. You couldn't pay me enough money to coach that team with the way Jerry uh, treats his head coach. But well, I mean, I don't know. I mean, uh, you could probably pay I me mean, enough money. There's, a, there's a lot of people that have to deal with far worse. I'm sure than fair. Mike McCarthy is in their job. <laughs> fair enough. Fair <laughs> enough. I forgot to ask you at the beginning on the way out. So Rocco's obviously uh, in uh, at the College World Series in Omaha does the Jello shots and whatnot. How, is it as crazy? Like, are people just shooting jello shots all over the place you in know, that place? Like, is, it, that, is it as crazy as they make it seem on social? It was really tame, although I have to, you know, freely admit, for the first three days I was there, I couldn't get into the place. That's how many people were there and <laughs> then outside nuts. of it. But we went there after the Aggie second ball game. And I think, you know, like from a sociology standpoint, it's just kind of fun to sit back and observe. You know, you have the youth in the club. And then you've got like the parents that were in there Indicla. and, you know, and older Aggies. And it was mostly Aggies in there after the Aggies won an epic ball game in game two. It was super late at night. But, you know, like there was a Tennessee fan passing him out and trying to get rid of his whole cachet of orange jello shots. 
And so he gave me one, and I, I took a picture of it just because I thought it made a great hood ornament next to the <laughs> Coca-Cola cup that I had with the College World Series logo on it. So I don't know. It, it's fascinating, and I just can't say enough about the environment. Every team's fan base was nice. The town was beautiful, clean, and it was just – if this is what heaven's supposed to look like, sign me up for Omaha this time of year every year. I got to make it out there at some point. But yeah, it's fun. That's all we got for you today on the Sneakers Cleats podcast. Wait, hold on. Bob has something to say. One one last comment from uh, Bobby Ryan. Uh, Bobby Ryan. As far as number 12 is concerned, uh, Kenny the Snake Stabler, one of my favorite. Okay, players. there's That's another good one. Good one. Yep. See, like I said, the quarterbacks in, for number 12 are absolutely insane. Um, thank you to everyone who commented. We appreciate it. We will always read them on on if you uh, comment something that can contribute to the conversation, which everyone did, which is awesome. Um, that's all we got for you today on the Sneakers Cleats podcast. Remember to download, rate, review, subscribe, give us a five star rating, tell a friend, tell an enemy. We will be back here on Thursday, recapping the first round to see if how exactly wrong all of us were with <laughs> the Spurs and and uh, speculating on what they're going to do at four and eight, or maybe they trade up to one. Who the hell knows? We'll t- be back here on Thursday to talk about it all. Until then, everyone have a good week.